The preliminary report is out on the ATR that crashed near Sao Paulo, Brazil on the 9th of August, killing all 58 passengers and four crew members in a flat spin that was recorded by multiple eyewitnesses. It's pretty clear from this preliminary report that it was severe icing that brought this aircraft down. But now the question for investigators is, why did this crew apparently blow off so many warnings about the icing conditions that they were in before losing control of the aircraft? My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and this video is brought to you by the folks that support this channel here on Patreon. First, let's start with the weather. As reported on my initial report on this crash, there was severe icing in the area. Of course, it's winter time in Sao Paulo now. A weather front was passing through, and there's a lot of technical information about the weather in this preliminary report, but the bottom line was that there was severe icing with a base of 14,000 feet and tops at 18,000 feet. This aircraft was right in the middle of it at 17,000 feet. Regarding the wreckage of the aircraft, they found no indication of an in-flight fire on board the aircraft and they saw no initial problems with the engines or anything that could have otherwise precluded normal flight of the aircraft. Both pilots were current and qualified in the aircraft with the captain having a total of 5,248 hours total time and the second in command or co-pilot having 5,143 hours total time. Now the captain only had 665 hours in this type of aircraft, which indicates to me that he fairly recently upgraded to captain in this airplane, whereas the co-pilot had most of his time, 3,543 hours in this same type of aircraft. So the second in command was much more experienced in this aircraft. In this initial report, investigators have already released the flight data recorder information and within this data tells the entire story. They also have the ATC audio tapes. They did not release the cockpit voice recorder. Before we can interpret this data, we have to review the systems that are on board the ATR that help it deal with icing conditions. Being a turboprop aircraft, the ATR is stuck in icing conditions much of the time. So it has to have a robust de-icing and anti-icing system. So the anti and de-icing system can be broken up as follows. There's icing systems that are on all the time for your probes. Then there are pneumatic de-icing systems, which you turn on once you encounter icing, and that includes the pneumatic boots that inflate and deflate along the leading edge of the wing and on the tail. And this is all used from bleed air from the engines, more on that in a minute, and also hot bleed air goes into the engine air intakes and something called a gas path de-icer, which I'm not too familiar with. Besides de-icing equipment, you have anti-icing equipment, which is to be turned on before you enter icing conditions, and that's done electrically. And electrically, you can heat the propellers, the control horns of the ailerons and the elevator, the probes, as well as the windshields. And these three different types of icing systems are managed on this panel here. Here's your probes that you turn on before the flight and the windows. Then you've got the anti-icing systems, the electronic anti-icing systems, the props, the horns, and the windows. And then you have the de-icing system, which is done pneumatically using hot engine bleed air, which heats the engine intakes and inflates and deflates the pneumatic boots located on the wings and tail. The pneumatics required for the de-icing capability come from the high pressure and low pressure sections of each engine. This comes long before the two air conditioning packs. Now on this particular flight, on this particular aircraft, one of these air conditioning packs was in op. I believe it was pack number one, but that should have no bearing on the ability for the aircraft to pneumatically de-ice the aircraft as this air is coming right out of the engine, high pressure and low pressure compressor sections, and is not impacted by whether the pack is operational or not. The packs are used to pressurize and air condition the aircraft. And with only one pack operational, the aircraft can go via a thing called the MEL minimum equipment list 
and you go through that list and find out what your new limitations are. And one of the limitations for a single pack operation on the ATR is that you can fly no higher than 17,000 feet. 17,000 feet was where this accident occurred or began the whole sequence of the stall spin. To help you determine when you are in icing conditions, the ATR has a very simple ice evidence probe, which is simply a metal step located below the cockpit window to visually indicate ice buildup on the aircraft. In addition to this is the electronic ice detector located out here on the left wing. This electronic ice detector located on the left wing will give you an icing light up here on the icing detection panel. And if you have the horns electrical anti-icing system on, you will also get an icing AOA green indication light telling you that you're in icing conditions and your critical angle of attack has changed due to the icing. And that's the whole problem with icing is it completely alters the performance of the aircraft. It increases your stall speed along with increasing your weight and decreasing the performance characteristics and handling of the aircraft. In addition to all that, because this is so critical on the ATR, a turboprop aircraft with slender wings operating in icing conditions, you also have this aircraft performance monitoring system that you set up before takeoff where you put the weight of the aircraft, dial it in with this dial indicator here, and that helps this computer figure out these three warnings right here. Cruise speed low, degraded performance, and increased speed. Each of these are three different lights warning you that you are getting very close to stalling the aircraft due to ice accumulating on the airframe and airfoils of the aircraft. In addition to all that, you have an additional airspeed bug. Airspeed bugs are used in high performance aircraft to help you determine airspeeds of various functions of the aircraft at various configurations. Well, on the ATR, you have a red icing bug that you need to set when you're in icing conditions to give you a minimum speed flaps up to maintain while in icing conditions. Now, though they didn't release the cockpit voice recorder, it sounds like they investigators have listened to the cockpit voice recorder and they say that during the execution of the procedures, the crew mentioned that the icing bug would be adjusted to the speed of 165 knots a speed consistent with the calculations performed by the investigation committee based on the weight of the aircraft. There are checklists associated with each of the different warning lights. For example, the cruise speed low light checklist is here. Icing conditions monitor, speed monitor. If the degraded performance light comes on, you follow this procedure here. And if the increase air or increased speed light comes on, increase to bug plus 30, severe icing procedures apply. If you get the increased speed light, you are basically in severe icing procedures and you need to get out of that ice of that situation. And here's your basic severe icing procedure. Power up, descend, go to your minimum en route altitude, and then firmly hold the control wheel and disconnect the autopilot because the aircraft's performance is degrading to such a point that you may not be able to control the aircraft. You need to get out of the severe icing conditions. And then finally, de-icing airframe fault. If you get a fault light in your, icing in your icing system, you need to get out of icing conditions. You cannot malinger around in icing conditions if there is a fault with your de-icing system on board the aircraft. Now with a basic understanding of the systems on board the aircraft and the checklists associated with them, we can better understand this data from the data recorder. So first starting from the bottom, working our way up, we have altitude. The aircraft takes off and climbs right to 17,000 feet and maintains 17,000 feet until which point that they lose control of the aircraft. Roll angle is the next line showing uh, just little bits of turns left and right until they lose control of the aircraft. Ice detection, the red line, the third line up. The ice detection system detecting ice went on in one, two, three, four, five, six different times. The ice detection system would activate, turn on, and then turn off. 
the airframe de-icing, the fourth line up, the green line. This is manually operated by the pilots by turning on the switch to inflate the boots on the wings and tail of the aircraft using the high pressure bleed air off the engines, high and low pressure. And it looks like it's activated once early in the flight and then turned off and then two more times later on in the flight, but turned off just prior to losing control of the aircraft. Next line, blue, indicated airspeed. Indicated airspeed comes up to about 200 knots indicated and remains at 200 knots indicated until it very insidiously drops off right prior to losing control of the aircraft. Remember, as ice accumulates on the aircraft, your critical angle of attack changes such that you are getting very much closer to the critical angle of attack as ice accumulates onto the airframe. Even though your indicated airspeed remains the same, your stall speed is rising rapidly. And it takes a very little decrease in indicated airspeed to exceed the critical angle of attack with the airframe iced up. In this case, I believe the aircraft or the airframe was only one and a half degrees nose high when they lost control of the aircraft due to the icing. The master warning light only came on once right when they lost control of the aircraft. I assume that's when they entered the full stall and spin. The icing AOA light came on once at 15, 12, 46 and remained on for the remainder of the flight. The cruise speed low warning indication came on multiple times and came off multiple times. The degraded performance came on once just prior to losing control of the aircraft and the increased speed warning came on once just prior to losing control of the aircraft. So there's multiple indications of icing of the aircraft entering icing conditions. What is the crew doing about it? And here in the sequence of events, we can begin to glean some of that information. So at four, starting up at the top, 1458, they take off. At 1512, they turn the propeller anti-icing on. At 15, 14, 56, the electronic ice detector connected to the CAS system emitted an alert signal, first time passing 13,000 feet. 1515, airframe de-icing was turned on. At 15, 15, 42, a single chime was heard in the cockpit. Subsequently, the crew commented on the occurrence of an airframe de-icing fault light. Remember what the checklist said about a fault light in the de-icing system? You are to avoid icing conditions altogether. You can no longer fly in icing conditions if you have a fault in the de-icing or anti-icing system. At 15, 15, 49, airframe de-icing was turned off by the crew. It's game over. You can't go mess around in icing conditions any longer. Now we get multiple electronic ice detector um, signals going, coming on and off, but they just continue the flight. The SIC, second in command or the co-pilot makes radio contact with a dispatcher, talking business as usual with dispatch. He's chatting up with the flight attendants uh, about information he's got to get to dispatch. The electronic ice detector continues to come on and off. The airframe de-icing was turned on at 1617. At 1618.41, at 191 knots, the cruise speed low alert was triggered while the co-pilot was still relaying information to the dispatcher. Then the captain starts briefing the approach for landing. There's a frequency change. There's another single chime heard in the cockpit. They do not explain what that chime was. 161907, the airframe de-ice was turned off. They made a call to Sao Paulo approach and Sao Paulo directed the crew to maintain 17,000 feet right there smack dab in the middle of the icing because of traffic below. ATC was going to hold them even longer in these icing conditions, but nobody's reported anything about icing to ATC at this time. So ATC has no awareness of the crew's current situation. 
So the crew acknowledges the clearance to remain at 17,000 feet, and then at 16, 19, 28, at 184 knots, the degraded performance alert was triggered with a single chime. Meanwhile, the crew is still talking to Sao Paulo approach. At 16, 19, 33, the captain continues his approach briefing as if nothing's happening. At 16.20, even, the co-pilot finally makes a comment about a lot of icing. Has anybody bothered to look out and look at the, the manual icing probe on the side of the aircraft and see how much ice is actually building up on the airframe at this time? At 16.20.05, the airframe de-icing was turned on for a third time. At 1620.33, Sao Paulo Approach clears the aircraft direct to Sanpa and maintain flight level 170. I misspoke earlier when I said 18,000 feet. Technically, it's flight level 180 as the transition level is different down there in uh, near Sao Paulo. So flight level 170 and inform that the descent would be authorized in two minutes. The crew acknowledged receipt of that and then started a right turn towards Sanpa and it was right here in this right hand turn that they began to lose control of the aircraft. And here's what that loss of control looks like according to a recreation on this accident. In this recreation from the flight data recorder, here's the animation of the aircraft up here. Going from left to right, here's your artificial horizon showing the aircraft attitude. Here's your indicated airspeed, your alti altitude about 17,000 feet. Here's your engine parameters. Here's your icing light parameters. And here's the position of the aircraft. Nesse momento, o controle São Paulo autoriza aquele voo direto à posição Sampa e ele inicia a sua curva à direita. O increase speed acionado com 169 nós. A partir daí, houve-se ruídos de vibração na aeronave, com inclinação máxima de 32 graus. A curva é revertida, acionamento de alarme de stall até 52 graus à esquerda e, após isso, pequeno ganho de altura e 94 graus com curva direita entrando em parafuso. Após isso, a aeronave se estabiliza em queda vertical e entra num parafuso chato com curva pela esquerda, 5 graus até a sua colisão com o solo. Remember, you can stall an aircraft at any indicated airspeed or any attitude, but only one critical angle of attack. And as ice accumulates on your airframe and your wings, your critical angle of attack changes dramatically. And even at your cruise speed, at only one and a half degrees nose high, you can be exceeding your critical angle of attack. Add to that stall just a little bit of yaw, one way or another, and you're gonna enter a spin. Entering a spin in the weather is extremely disorienting and your chances of ever recovering a twin engine aircraft like one of these twin engine turboprops from a spin, especially a flat spin, is very unlikely, even once you break out of the weather. There's simply too much mass located outside the center of rotation of the aircraft in order to recover from a flat spin in one of these twin engine aircraft. So investigators know that it was icing that brought this aircraft down. But why? Why did the crew ignore so many warnings about the icing? Did they truly believe that these were false indications given by a faulty icing detection system on board the aircraft? Or were, was there some other holes in the Swiss cheese that have not yet been uncovered by accident investigators that it might have led the, the crew down this rosy path of destruction? The ATR aircraft has a long history of sensitivity to icing and flying in icing conditions that most all ATR pilots are very well aware of. And flying in icing conditions has to be treated with the utmost respect in any of these turboprop aircraft and even more importantly in light twin general aviation aircraft. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.